Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Julie, I am a mom of five, and just over the past, well, I guess it's been a few years now, I have been experimenting with sourdough, learning how to make breads and pancakes and waffles and English muffins and cinnamon rolls and so many delicious recipes with sourdough. Over the past, I want to say about six months, I have learned how to make a sourdough artisan loaf. So not sourdough sandwich bread, but your kind of traditional sourdough loaf. And I have had so much fun learning how to, how to make a delicious and beautiful loaf. I found a recipe that I have been following and I have played around with that recipe a bit to work with my starter, like the, the hydration of my starter, the temperature of my house, the temperature of my oven, all these details. I've had to kind of just play around with the recipe to make it work. And you will likely have to do the same. I will link the recipe that I use. Shout out to Lisa from Farmhouse on Boone. Almost all that I know about sourdough, I have learned from her. And so I got that recipe from her website. And I'll share what I have adjusted as I talk about this recipe. So I'm just gonna go through it step by step and share with you how I make the sourdough bread. Actually, first I should say, sourdough has such healthy nutritional benefits. It gets its yeast from the air, so there's no yeast added to it, and so that's just a lot better for your belly, for your gut. This recipe I'm gonna share, for one, it's delicious. It tastes so good. My family loves this bread. We'll have it with ham and cheese. We'll have it as toast for breakfast. We'll often serve it with soups or stews. It's just versatile and we love it. This recipe only uses three ingredients, water, flour, I guess four, water, flour, your sourdough starter, and salt. So here is how I make this recipe. You want to start with an active bubbly starter. So if you have fed it within the last 12 hours, between four and 12 hours, you will have a nice bubbly starter. Now here is my first, well, not really an adjustment. I do usually use a starter that has been fed in the last four to 12 hours, but I have also a couple times used starter discard so i haven't fed it for over 24 hours it's been in my fridge i pull it out i tried to make a recipe and it turned out just as good as my other recipe so there is a lot of flexibility to this but if you have a nice bubbly active starter that is optimal into a glass bowl i will put four cups of all-purpose flour and a cup and a half of water. Again, depending on the hydration of your starter, the recipe I use says a cup and a quarter of water, but I found a cup and a half works better. So four cups of flour, a cup and a half of water, and I use a wooden spoon to get this all mixed together. Now, side note, I have to mention, I use unbleached all-purpose flour, and I've done a little bit of research on this because a lot of recipes will call for bread flour. And so what I have found, which I thought was really interesting, is that in Canada, where I am, guidelines, our standards are very high. And so our all-purpose flour has the protein levels of a bread flour in the U.S. So if you're in Canada and you use all-purpose flour, that all-purpose flour is high quality, high protein. If you're in the U.S., it's different. I just find that really interesting, but... We are blessed, I guess, in Canada to have this high quality all-purpose flour. So once I have mixed that flour and water together, I am going to add one cup of my sourdough starter and I sprinkle on top two teaspoons of sea salt. Now here is where I get my hands messy. I put my fingers right into that mixture and I start to just dimple that starter and salt into the flour and water mixture underneath. I am not going to be kneading this bread or kneading this dough. I just kind of keep pressing my fingertips in, scraping off that extra starter that gets on my hands and just getting that mixture all mixed. It will be a little bit lumpy, it will be wet, it's not going to look like smooth bread dough yet, but you do want to make sure that all of the ingredients are 
incorporated. Then I lift the dough and just pour a little bit of olive oil into the bottom of my bowl. I just take that sourdough and I just kind of rub it in the olive oil, turning it around, just getting it lightly coated with oil. I leave it in the bowl and then I use these handy jar or bowl covers and they work really well. You could use saran wrap. You want something that's going to be sealed, sealing that dough inside your bowl. Then you want to find a warm space, if you can, to, to set your bowl. I have this, I call it the electrical room. It's right off of our kitchen. Our hot water heater is in there. And so it is the warmest space in our house. And so especially in the winter, when the rest of our house is a little bit cooler, that is a great spot for me to leave my, my dough when I'm making bread to let it rise. This is when I start my stretch and fold process. So I will leave this bowl to the side here for 30 to 45 minutes. Then I will take it out and I will do my first stretch and fold. So I take the cover off, I take one side of the dough and I just pull it up, stretch it out, and then I lay it down over the rest of the dough. Like a little blanket, I'm laying over the ball of dough. So after that first stretch and fold, I rotate the bowl just 45 degrees, and I do another stretch and fold over top of that first stretch and fold. I turn it again and I do four turns. So I have done four stretch and folds. Then I cover it back up and I place it back into that warm area. 30 minutes later, I will take the bowl out again and do another stretch and fold. This is where you'll find a lot of different opinions on how many stretch and folds you should do, how far apart your stretch and folds should be. So I usually do my stretch and fold process over about three hours. I will do anywhere from three to six stretch and folds. If I am home this whole time, I will probably do six stretch and folds once every half hour over those three hours. But if I have an appointment to get to, I have to go out and I only do three stretch and folds, that's fine too. There is a lot to be said with just playing with it and figuring it out for yourself. Once you do it a few times, you kind of figure out what you want your dough to look like. I find this so interesting how much the consistency of the dough changes as you go through these stretch and folds. So the first one is wet, kind of lumpy, it doesn't look smooth at all yet. You do that first stretch and fold and usually I can stretch it pretty far the first time. The longer you go, the kind of stiffer your dough is, almost thicker and stretchier. Your dough gets really smooth and it's just really cool to watch that process as the sourdough yeast is getting into the whole ball of dough here. After those three hours of periodically doing my stretch and folds, I will once again cover my bowl, set it in my warm spot, and I will leave it for about three more hours. So I will check on it after about three hours and see if it's doubled. If it's doubled, I know that that's where I want it to be. You don't want your dough to rise too much just to doubled. You'll see the consistency of that dough. You'll see that it's, if you poke it, it'll just bounce back. It looks nice and fluffy. You can tell that the size has grown. You'll likely see a few bubbles on the surface and your dough is ready for the next step. So now I will bring my bowl of dough over to the counter. I'll sprinkle some flour on the countertop and then just gently pull that dough out of the bowl and onto your counter. You don't want to be punching your dough or flattening it and releasing those bubbles. You wanna just gently put it onto your floured surface. Then I take my hands and I just shape that ball of dough. I'm kind of reaching underneath and pushing it into this nice big round ball of dough. I'm always like building it up, making it more round, making it taller. You'll feel those bubbles as you're doing this process. You want the top of your dough to be getting nice and smooth and round. You will pop some of those bubbles as you're doing this and that's okay, but you want to leave as many of those bubbles as you can. I really enjoy this step, just getting my dough bigger and rounder. 
I leave my dough sitting on the countertop here for about 30 minutes. It just forms a little skin. As it's sitting there, I get out my banneton basket and I lightly flour the inside. There are different options you can do for this step. I have a banneton basket, so this is the only way I've ever done this, but I've heard that you can just use a basket or a bowl with a tea towel inside and drape the tea towel over it. So there are different options you can look into, but I find a banneton basket to be a really good, a good purchase. It's not expensive and I, I use it all the time. So after my dough has sat for about 30 minutes, I come and I turn my dough over. I pull in all four sides, then I turn the dough back over and just make sure it's still a nice round shape. I turn it back over as I place it inside the banneton basket. So when it's inside your banneton basket, you want that seam side to be facing up. I cover the dough and then I once again set it back on the shelf in my warm room and I leave it here for about two to four hours. Around two hours later, I just go and check on the dough and if I can see through the top of my, through this lid here, if I can see that my dough is nice and domed on the top, I know that it has risen enough. And so now I will transfer it to the fridge and it will sit in the fridge overnight a lot of these steps I'm sharing for like how long you let it rise and how long you let it sit on the counter to form that skin and how long it sits in the warm room in the banneton basket. A lot of this is just things I have learned from reading recipes, Facebook groups, watching YouTube videos that these are are things to do when you make a sourdough loaf. I have not learned a lot of these things from personal experience. So I haven't tried not even leaving my banneton basket on the counter and putting it straight in the fridge. Maybe you could do that and it would be fine too. So this isn't like trial and error that I have learned. I have mostly just followed the recipe. I probably will over time, you know, try different things and oh, I don't have time to do this step. I'm gonna skip this step and see how it works. What I have found is that sourdough is resilient. Even if you follow a recipe and it says to leave it for this amount of time and that and do this step, you can often switch things up and your sourdough will still be hearty. But these, these are the steps that I do and I'm doing something right because my loaves turn out so well. I am so happy with them. So the next morning, I'm gonna take my banneton basket out of the fridge. I have my, uh, what do they call this? Like a parchment paper liner. I'm trying to remember what the name of it is right now. I think it's called a sourdough bread sling. So when I first started making sourdough, I used parchment paper for this step, but then I found this sling. I'm not wasting anymore, and I really love how it works. So I lay this sling out. I will dump my bread dough here on top. I'm just gonna dust the top with flour and just use my hands to coat the whole top of the loaf with that flour. Actually, you know what? I totally missed a step. The, you are gonna wanna get your Dutch oven out and you're gonna stick that in the oven and turn the oven on to 500 degrees. So I put my Dutch oven into the oven and then turn it on so it heats up with the oven up to 500 degrees and I leave it for about 45 minutes. And it's when the Dutch oven is nearing the end of its warming up time. That's when I skip ahead to this step and get my dough ready to go into the oven. So I have floured the whole top of my, my dough now. And this is the fun part where I get out my bread lame, or you can just use a razor blade and you get to just make a fun design on the top of your bread dough. A basic one I often start with is just a plus sign. Uh, then I started doing these little leaves on the side. You want to have some cut on your dough to let the bread breathe. It's going to need air to escape somewhere. So if you don't make a cut, it will make its own cut and not look as pretty as one that you make yourself. This is just a really fun step. It's been enjoyable to practice and I've gotten better at making these designs as I go. And now I'm gonna take the Dutch oven out of the oven, take the lid off, and I'm gonna transfer this bread sling right into my Dutch oven. 
I'm gonna turn my oven down to 475 degrees, lid on, and I'm gonna stick that Dutch oven into my oven for 18 minutes. My times are a little bit funny here, but like I said, I have played with it. Every oven is different, and I find that my loaves turn out perfectly when I follow these temperatures and times. When I first started making this recipe, I did follow the recipe I was following online step by step, and the oven temperatures were a little bit warmer, the, the cook times were a little bit longer, and my loaves were definitely overdone, especially the bottom was really dark, and so I played with oven temperatures and times, and this is what I have found to work perfectly for my oven. Yours will likely be different. So 475 degrees for 18 minutes. Once that 18 minutes are done, I take the lid off of the Dutch oven. I turn my oven down to 450 degrees and I leave it for 16 more minutes. Then I take the bread out of the oven. I love this step actually when I take the lid off of the Dutch oven because it's just fun to see like, oh, here's the reveal. How much has my bread risen? How does that pattern look as it's baking? Uh, and then you just leave it to, to brown for that last, that last 16 minutes is what I do. And then when I take it out, here is the look of my finished loaf of bread. You do want to let your bread sit and cool for a while before you cut into it. Again, this is not tested by me, but I hear that your loaf will be gummy and it's just a lot harder to cut if your loaf is warm. So I will leave it for two, preferably three hours before I cut into it. So how the timeline looks for me, I usually will start my, my recipe at about nine in the morning it's done all of the stretch and folds by noon, so it sits until three o'clock. Then I shape it and leave it in the banneton basket for a couple of hours. I'm usually putting the banneton basket into the fridge right around five o'clock. It stays in the fridge overnight. First thing in the morning, I turn on my oven. Uh, an hour later, I get my bread into the oven and it's out of the oven by about nine or 9.30, and then I can slice it and we will eat it at lunch. And that's it. I think I covered all the steps for how I make this bread. I hope that you'll try out this recipe. It's so good for you and so simple once you get into the habit. So the first couple times I made this, I was like, oh my goodness, watching the video, checking the recipe, checking the steps, checking the time. And it felt like this is a lot to make this bread. And by about my third or fourth time, I had the recipe memorized. And so now I can throw it together, hardly even thinking about it, just pull it out, do my stretch and fold as I'm homeschooling the kids and just little breaks throughout the day. And now I find this process just really simple and I am making at least two or three loaves of sourdough bread each week. And believe me, it gets devoured. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd love to hear down in the comments if you try this recipe and how it turned out, what you think. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.